Welcome to the uh, the 10th Beer Tribology webinar. Uh, the technical part of this will start in a few minutes, just to uh, give you some introdu introductory slides and a little bit about the Tribology Minor. Um, so this all started uh, way back, probably like 2009, when uh, for, first met Ralph Beard. And uh, he uh, is from industry and noticed that there is a strong need for education in industry and tribology. And so at that time, uh, we had this idea of creating a minor. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away in, in 2017. And there's a fund for excellence at Auburn named after him now. And uh, NLGI also recently created an award in education named after Ralph. Um, so from then on, though, uh, you know, we've continued the program and during 20, uh, earlier this year, 20, actually in 2020, beginning of 2021, we decided to do a webinar. This was, uh, really came from our board uh, that suggested it. Um, and so we've been doing this about every month in 2021. We probably uh, won't continue it on the regular schedule in 2022, uh, but I still might do this a few times depending on um, speakers and how much interest there is. Uh, but all the, uh, the the webinars that we have done are available to watch. So if you go to the website, they're all listed there. A um, little bit about the minor. If you're interested in this program, there's a website. Uh, but for undergrad students, it requires about 15 hours of extra work beyond their degree. Uh, we also have a grad certificate and there's a link for that here too. Um, and that's more for people in industry who are looking to take a few classes in tribology uh, while they're working. So it's an online course or online um, program. Uh, this is a list of our board members. Uh, so Ross Shaw and Maureen Hunter are the current uh, co-chairs. Uh, and they were the ones who really encouraged uh, this idea of the, the webinar. Uh, but lots of experience in the board, and we really appreciate their support and advice in the, for the program. And also some sponsors um, who've donated great scholarships and some research opportunities for undergraduates. Um, so usually how I've been doing this is we'll uh, wait to the end for questions. So actually, I don't think I've done this yet, but I need to mute uh, everybody, but I'll do that in a second. And, uh, but at the end, um, if you have questions, just write them in the comment and then I'll read them. Uh, and then uh, our speaker will, will uh, answer them. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Um, it is uh, Isabella Zlufarska. She's a chair of uh, materials science and engineering at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she came to Auburn a while ago, we were trying to figure that out. It's probably about 10 years ago, but I've also seen her at various tribology uh, conferences. Uh, so she's very well known in that area. And I think also in materials engineering in general, material science. Uh, she has a PhD in physics um, from the University of Tennessee. She also did a postdoc at uh, University of Southern California. Um, she has a number of awards. This is just one of them. Uh, she won the best paper award uh, for Journal of Material Science. And uh, if you look at her work, she's a lot of publications that are all highly cited. Great, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me here to present my work. Uh, Rob, again, thank you for the invitation. Um, and I now realize I need to go back and look at your website and uh, listen to the previous talks. It seems like a great group uh, of speakers and um, I'm excited to learn about your minor as well. So I'll have to look in more detail into that. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, microstructural chemical evolution of frictional conducts. But before uh, I start, I wanted to acknowledge my uh, current and previous students. So Johan Lee had just graduated from my group uh, and Shu Guangwei and Hao Shi are in my group uh, still at present. And the work I'm going to present uh, is funded by uh, the National Science Foundation, Foundation as well as by uh, the Army Research Office. And since I'm a department chair, uh, and also you might not be familiar with uh, Madison, Wisconsin, I wanted to tell you just show you one slide of uh, beautiful Madison, Wisconsin. And so uh, Madison is the uh, flagship campus of the University of Wisconsin system. 
is also a state capital. So you can see here, this is the state capital on the isthmus between two lakes. This is our engineering campus. So it's a really beautiful place. If you haven't been, I encourage you to come and visit us. Um, it's a large university, about 40,000 students, and uh, we are in the top 10 in uh, terms of the research expenditures in the country. In our department, we have, um, it's been a growing department. We have about 150 undergrads, undergrad students, now 20 for our faculty, I should change this number. <laughs> we just hired a faculty and we're looking for three more. Uh, so if you're interested in faculty position, uh, positions, I encourage you to look at our website and, uh, and see um, whether there is a good fit. So that's the school. Uh, in terms of my own research, I, um, my primary expertise is in developments of theory and multi-scale simulations. Uh, but in the last few years, I have also uh, developed an experimental program. About half of my group now is experimental, focus on materials characterization. Uh, and I bring these two approaches together, theory um, on one hand, theory and simulations, and the other hand, experiments to address problem in three sort of core areas in my group. And one of them is materials for extreme environments. So it's corrosion, uh, radiation, uh, nuclear applications, basically. Uh, another one is mechanical behavior of material, which is relevant for today's stock and friction, adhesion, and wear. Uh, and uh, the third one is electronic properties of defects for devices. So today I'll focus on the mechanical properties on friction and wear part of my work. Um, so, in particular, I want to focus on the fact that materials um, and interfaces and sliding contacts uh, are not static and they evolve. And so, uh, what controls the properties uh, is um, friction and, and wear is the properties the materials have while the contact is moving. And uh, so, it is challenging to understand and predict what these properties are because we're dealing with uh, buried interfaces under, under highly non equilibrium. Uh, conditions. And so there are um, at least two aspects of this evolution that, um, and two aspects that I believe are important and I focus on in my group. And so one of that is the evolution of the chemistry of interfaces. So we put materials in contact, uh, we have a sliding interface, there will be chemical reactions taking place at the interface. And these chemical reactions are also coupled to the deformation of the solids uh, that are in contact. So we need to really understand uh, what these uh, tribal chemical reactions are and how they are coupled to the stress field. So this is called mechanochemistry. And the second aspect is uh, microstructural evolution. So the microstructure that develops in sliding contacts near a sliding interface, it's a, uh, a so-called tribal layer, uh, can be very different from the original material and from the microstructure that exists far away from the interface. So the traditional structure property relations uh, that we learn about and, and courses or that have been discovered, uh, they're of limited use because we are de dealing with a sort of dynamic, because of the dynamic nature of the contact. And so I divided this talk into two parts. In the first one, I'll talk about, um, uh, so there's uh, chemical evolution of interfaces and sliding contacts. And in the second part, I'll talk about uh, deformation and microstructural evolution of sliding contacts. So hopefully everybody will find something uh, that's of interest uh, to you. So let's start with the um, chemical evolution. So in general, the effect of mechanical forces on chemical reactions is uh, referred to as me mechanochemistry. And interestingly, mechanochemistry has been practiced by people for a very long time. So uh, one of the early reports is they use a uh, mortar and pestle to make uh, mercury about 315 BC in, um, in Greece. And uh, mechanochemistry um, today is as a broad field, broadly studied in many different areas. And some of these areas are listed here. So it involves uh, mechanochemical synthesis. So uh, alloying of metals by ball milling, um, molecular level manipulation. So where a single molecule can be delivered to a surface and then a force is used to break the bond between the molecule and the probe or mechanobiochemistry, where uh, forces and stresses can be used to control, change the structure and functionality of proteins. I'm interested in tribochemistry because I'm interested in the um, coupling of stresses and chemical reactions in uh, frictional contacts. So um, that's what tribochemistry is. And there are three sort of broadly speaking types of uh, these um, chemical couplings. So one of them is for solid-solid contacts. An example would be formation of chemically passivating species 
uh, during sliding of uh, DLC on DLC, diamond like carbon, diamond like carbon, so, so dry contacts. Uh, we can have reactions that matter in people's study are reactions of a solid with a lubricant, so the development of a tribofilm, or reactions within the lubricant, like polymerization of uh, molecules under shear. So they're all important for, uh, for tribology. So now, um, so I understand that everybody here uh, uh, works in atomistic simulations. It is the primary tool that we use here. So let me just say a few words about that. Uh, so on the simulation side, the most common uh, methods for understanding the sort of uh, fundamental phenomena that contribute to friction and wear are uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So in these uh, simulations, um, we evolve positions uh, of all the atoms as a function of time following Newton's equation of motion. And the forces are derived from this energy function V here. And it's called, um, in this, this function, um, this energy can be calculated either classically or quantum mechanically. So when it's calculated classically, we call it um, a force field or empirical potential. And uh, the, um, it, the, the, the sort of studies in this area have been really enabled by the ver development of force fields that are called reactive force fields that allow us to study chemical reactions. So even though they are classical, they're still capable of capturing yeah, chemical yeah. reactions in interfaces. Now, um, in cases where the classical forces don't exist or have not been validated, uh, we can use um, quantum mechanical approaches. So we can carry our molecular dynamics just like in a classical case, but now the forces and energies are calculated directly from uh, quantum mechanics. So an example here is the uh, study from Michel Mosler of uh, humidity effects on friction of diamond. But now whether it's classical or quantum mechanical uh, simulations, one thing that's important to remember and keep in mind, these are very powerful simulations, but there is a limitation to them. Uh, and it's not just the length scales, you're looking at small systems, but, but also time scales. So the time scales that are accessible to typical or to molecular dynamic simulations, uh, they go maybe up to a microsecond. So if we look at the phenomena that take place at a slower rate or extend uh, longer, then uh, we need to uh, use special tools to extend uh, the time scales of molecular dynamic simulations. And I'll show you examples of, of how we do that as well. So these are the simulations. Now experimentally, uh, one can measure, if we want to understand chemical reactions in the interfaces. It is difficult to do it in operando or in situ, really see what um, species are there. Uh, it's pretty challenging. So experimentally, one typically either measures the changes in physical properties or in chemical uh, properties or the, or the state of the surface. And so here's a really nice example from uh, Rob Carpick from University of Pennsylvania, who used AFM to monitor in situ nucleation and growth of tribofilms in ZDDP containing lubricants by measuring basically thickness and morphology of uh, the tribofilm that was wear resistant. Um, here is an example of measuring chemical properties. Um, it is, uh, again, as I said, it's not easy to do that in operando, but uh, what I like about this example is that it combines experimental measurements with uh, simulations. So the simulations can provide interpretation for what is being measured uh, experimentally. In this case, it's Bolland's experiments with mass spectrometer and simulations are aiding interpretation of uh, what specific chemical reactions are taking place. This is DLC by starting on DLC. So theoretically, um, the effect of stresses on chemical reactions is often described by um, so-called Irene model or Bell's model. Uh, which have different fact functional form, but generally they uh, say that assume that the rate of chemical reactions here given by K dep depends exponentially on some kind of energy barrier to chemical reactions. And now the effects of stresses are such that this energy barrier here E depends linearly on the applied stress, here is sigma. And so we can look at this picture if you applied stress, this is the original black energy landscape, this is sort of how what is the barrier to chemical reactions? If we apply stress or shear stress at the interface, it will alter uh, the barrier, uh, maybe in this case, uh, decrease it and will make the reactions faster, okay? So that's sort of how we describe the effects of stresses on the uh, reactions at the interface. Now this coefficient delta V is a coefficient, it's called activation volume. And it's very important because it contains all the physics of uh, the phenomenon. It tells us everything about how the mechanical stresses are coupled to the chemical reactions. 
And it's really defined as this coefficient in energy expansion, uh, which is problematic because the meaning of this has been quite elusive and there's a lot of discussion about what it means. And it gets important because it allows us to design um, these reactions or understand how these um, uh, interfaces chemically will respond uh, to the applied shear. And so this activation volume, roughly speaking, has been associated in the past with um, the volume of the sort of group uh, of molecules that are involved in chemical reactions at the interface. So it can be lubricant or some polymer or whatever it is. Um, and so whatever the group um, is taking, is reacting, and the, the volume of that approximately has been sort of thought of as this activation volume. But this is a, a rough um, definition or understanding to say the least. Because if you look at uh, uh, experiments of uh, wear of silicon silica and the values that people extract from it to understand how the stresses affect uh, the reactivity of silica, you see that the, um, uh, the activation volume can, it can vary by two orders of magnitude, right? So, so something, something is going on. And so we wanted to understand it because again, this kind of contains the sort of secret or the design principles for understanding and controlling tribochemical reactions. So we wanted to understand it. We looked in this case at uh, silica-silica interfaces because uh, these are the interfaces that are studied. There were a lot of experiments reported on that so we could compare. And these are quantum mechanical calculations based on technique called uh, DFT. Uh, but it's basically quantum mechanical calculations where we did surfaces together. Uh, the surfaces uh, have a known chemistry in this case, uh, a passivator with these OH groups. And then when they come together, they form this, uh, form this strong silicon oxygen silicon bond, this called siloxane bond. And friction is now proportional, we have shown before, proportional to this number of strong bonds across the interface. So if you form these kind of covalent bonds, this sort of tells you how friction is going to increase. And so we perform these calculations uh, for different kinds of silica surfaces. So here are just a couple of examples showing cristobalite and quartz. And this is the reaction energy as a function of pressure. It's a linear function, so it's consistent with the models I've been showing before. And from the slope of these, we can get the activation volume, which is really the coupling of the chemistry to mechanics. Uh, so when we extract it uh, in these particular cases, we get values of 20 or 80 uh, angstrom cubed. And if you compare to experiments, it agrees well with experiments, right? But, uh, but it's not that hard to do because experiments, their range is uh, by two orders of magnitude. So it's not particularly impressive, but it allows us to say, you know, what is really happening? Why are these two values different for the same material, for the same reaction? Um, and uh, why are they different in measured experiments? And so we looked into this. And um, uh, I have a, a very good graduate student, Johan Lee, who actually just graduated, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and I would love to keep you in my group. But, um, so he has figured out a way to separate the contributions to this mechanochemical coupling from different parts of the system. And so he has figured out a way to determine the contribution from the interface, which is sort of what people normally believe, this is the chemical reactions taking place, versus from the surrounding bulk. And here are the um, results. So this is showing our reaction energies for the two cases I showed you earlier. Uh, the total uh, energy is the blue, and now the contribution from the interface is the green one, and from the bulk is the red one. And again, the activation volume of the mechanical chem uh, chemical coupling is the slope of these, and they're calculated here on the table. And lo and behold, you can see that the bulk contribution is not only significant, but actually in some cases is dominant. And so what it means is that uh, mechanical chemical coupling for these sort of sliding interfaces and under pressure uh, is not necessarily controlled by uh, stress-induced changes in the inter interfacial groups and the sort of molecules that are trapped at the surface, but by the stress-induced deformation of the surrounding bulk. So the surrounding properties of the surrounding bulk matter. And in fact, in some cases can be dominant. So we found it surprising because it's different than what people typically believe in. And let me show you the consequences of that. So first of all, uh, to, we have developed a theory to be able to predict um, this uh, activation volume or, uh, or explain it. So this is um, theory based on the uh, first order perturbation theory details in this paper. I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's, so here's the gist of it. The activation volume uh, is inversely, so mechanical chemical coupling, inversely related to the stiffness of the system. Now the stiffness of the system can be broken down into different components, here interface and the bulk. 
So what that means basically that the softer part of the system, in case of the bulb, is going to dominate the mechanochemical coupling. So you have, a, you have a system of material that has different parts. The softer part is what's going to control the mechanical chemical coupling, mechanical chemical coupling at the interface. Uh, and it could be bulk, right? So you can ask, you know, what uh, materials will have that, right? Because typically we're thinking of the interface molecules being fairly soft and the solid being hard. And uh, it's actually true of silica as well. If you look at the stiffness or modulus of our system for silica, the bulk is about 190 gigapascal, the interface 72, right? So what's going on, bulk is stiffer, but it turns out that for these, even for these stiff systems, for these solids, if you look at the near interface region, they can be much softer because of the surface effect. So near interface region, in the case of silica, are a few nanometers. Because of the surface effects on the bond orientation and changes in the bond length, is actually much softer. And it's the near interface region that controls uh, the coupling of um, tribochemical reactions to stresses. It's not the interface, not the huge solid, but the near interface region here. And what it also means that uh, the mechanochemical coupling will depend on the geometry of the contact. So if you look at the, um, so the energy to chemical reactions at the interface, we have the sort of uh, energies without any stresses. And here is the mechanochemical uh, coupling uh, component. So we talked about the activation volume, right? And we said the majority of uh, this can come from the bulk, the near interface region. And the other term in this expression is stress. So different contacts, different sizes of contacts, different geometries will have a different stress distribution in the near interface region. And therefore, they will contribute differently to this mechanochemical coupling. So we believe that this is one of the reasons why um, experiments have been performed on nominally the same systems in this case, silica, but also in other examples, but reported a very different magnitude of the mechanochemical coupling is because the uh, bulk contributes and because the stress distribution in the bulk that comes from the contact is going to play an important role. Okay, so that's uh, one aspect of that, uh, sort of trying to get to the physics or chemistry of the mechanochemical coupling. I wanted to show you another, uh, what I think is a cool example of um, a fascinating of mechanochemical phenomenon um, that has been shown also on the example of silicon. And this is related to contact aging. Um, so it turns out that static friction is not truly static and that it depends on the age of contact. So it depends how long the contact was held in place uh, prior to sliding. So the longer we hold it in place, the larger the static friction. It also has implication for sliding friction Depends how fast we slide, we may have more of the sort of aging like phenomena or less. But it's easier to think about in terms of static friction. So, here are a couple of examples demonstrating this phenomenon experimentally. So, on the left hand side are experiments, again from uh, Rob Carpig's group, in humid environments in silica silica. And it's showing that static friction or friction here, lateral force, this is a function of displacement, that uh, it increases with the contact time. So the different colors represent how long the tip was held in um, contact prior to sliding. So this is 100 seconds. And on the right hand side, uh, this is a similar experiments have been reported by Andrew Schirmeisen for um, an ultra high vacuum and silica silica as well. So both of these are uh, single austerity AFM experiments. And the fundamental question that we wanted to answer is uh, what is the underlying physics of such aging? So we put two contacts together and they sort of grow um, and the static friction increases. And there's some evolution of that. What controls this evolution? And this is actually important for a multiple phenomena, but one of them is earthquake mechanics. Uh, earthquakes uh, are frictional instabilities. And it turns out that this kind of aging is a critical, critical condition for earthquake nucleation. So it's really important to understand what controls that. And so we uh, wanted to understand it. We looked at this. I wanted to point out one thing is that the time scales of these experiments, like 100 seconds, are well beyond uh, what's accessible to molecular dynamics. So we cannot apply standard molecular dynamics. And as I mentioned earlier, here is where we begin to um, so we have to develop new tools to be able to extend the time scales. So let me show you how we do that. 
So how do we study sort of like chemistry and the coupling to stresses over long time scales and over large length scales? Uh, so these are the multi-scale models. Let's start with uh, time scales. So different models developed in the literature, I'm gonna tell you, focus on the one we developed, is based on um, so-called kinetic Monte Carlo technique. And in principle, it's fairly simple. We represent the surface as a number of different bonding sites. So we have to understand the chemistry of the surfaces. It could change in the presence of water in different environments. Um, we also need to know the density of these different bonding sites. But anyway, so we know what they are. And then we use quantum mechanical calculations to determine what are the, the energy to, um, to have interfacial reactions. It's kind of bonding reactions across the interface. So we do that. Uh, it's not just one energy, it's this distribution of energies. And then we assign these energy to our bonding sites on the surface. Now, these energy can be turned into probabilities because basically they can be turned into rates of reactions. And based on this probability, we can statistically evolve the interface to say, as a function of time, how much bonding we're going to see. In other words, how much, stat how much the static friction is going to increase since, as I said, it is proportional to static friction is proportional to this number of bonds. So we did that. Uh, we have performed some simulations for, again, silica silica. Part of this because there were experiments available. Part of this where our funding was coming from, from geology. <laughs> uh, and um, so we have considered the energies to form these kinds of interfacial bonds. We put it into our KMC model. And we asked whether these kinds of bonding, whether these covalent bonding can lead to experimentally observe, observable aging. So when you put surfaces together, do the bonds form spontaneously, in, instantaneously, and the interface is bonded? Or do they form over long enough time to be able to see this kind of evolution uh, experimentally? And we found that um, uh, the, the covalent bonding can lead to a significant aging of the interfaces. So this is our predictions from our model. This is friction as a function of time. The blue points are um, experiments, and the red uh, points in the line is predictions from our model. So a, it shows that um, this is a log scale here on the vertical horizontal axis. So it goes to 100 seconds. So it shows that A, this covalent bonding can uh, occur slowly enough to uh, lead to significant aging experimentally, but also that we have a very good model for the chemical evolution of the interface. This is a single asperity contact. So what we did after that, we took this model and we um, used it to make new predictions. We said, okay, we know that frictional sliding is going to lead to heating of the interfaces. So we ask, how does the temperature going to affect the contact aging? Is the higher temperature more aging? Is the lower temperature better? And it turns out that there's uh, an optimum temperature to do that. So this is the um, uh, frictional aging is a function of temperature for silica. Different curves represent different hold times, so you can just ignore the different curves. But you can see there's a maximum at about room temperature where the aging is maximized. So there's an optimum temperature. Why is that? Uh, qualitatively speaking, we have a model for that, but just qualitatively high level picture is that temperature has two effects. One of them is that at a higher temperature, we're going to bond the interface faster. Um, so we're going to have more bonds because it's a thermally activated process. On the other hand, if there's a higher temperature, the bonds are weaker because once we start pulling on them, Again, as a temperature activated process, it will be easier to break them because of the higher temperature. So we have this competition, the higher temperature, we have more bonds, but the bonds are weaker. And the balance of those is, is going to be different for different materials, but for silica fell into this room temperature regime for uh, maximizing um, aging. Okay, so this was single asperity contact. Um, and I know for many industry people who are interested in sort of engineering surfaces, so rough surfaces, is the same true for geological surfaces that uh, our funding came from. So we said, how does the finding from a single asperity of these sort of chemical evolutions and affecting friction, how does it translate to rough macroscopic contact? And uh, so in other words, we like to be able to answer questions like these. Just an example, uh, which of these surfaces, the smoother one or the rougher one is going to be more aging due to chemistry in this case? So on one hand, the rougher surface has uh, fewer peaks, so lower contact area, but higher pressure. And the smoother surface has a higher contact area, but they have low, lower local pressure. So, you know, it's, it's hard to know. We didn't know a priori. It's not an, um, an obvious answer. 
And so to do that, we said, okay, we want to sort of uh, have a model now that we not only extend the time scales, but we extend the length scales and consider RAF uh, engineering type of surfaces. So the first thing we had to do is consider the effect of pressure. I already talked about how pressure affects chemical reactions. So this is this mechanochemistry aspect. So we included this in our model. We started just with a single asperity first, um, and we include the effects of pressure, right? So we include the mechanochemistry. We have also included the fact that if we have a single asperity and we increase the normal load, uh, the contact area, the nominal contact area is going to increase as well. So we're going to have more of these bonding sites. So we put it together and again, started with a single asperity and uh, we were able to compare to Rob Carpig's experiments uh, again. So that allow us to validate the model and you can see that uh, we have very good agreement. The model works very well. So this is a frictional sliding on that vertical axis. This is normal load. Um, the different curves correspond to different aging times. So you can ignore just pick one of them. And you can see that the higher the load, the more aging we have, okay? And you can also see that the solid points are experimental points. The open symbols are our simulation. So we have a model that can uh, accurately capture the pressure effects on aging, at least in a single asperity. So then we say, okay, let's go to multi-asperity contact. Um, we uh, initially have assumed that a contact is elastic, considering plasticity and creep is important, but it's another challenge. <laughs> Uh, that we want to address in the future, but starting with the elastic deformation, uh, we use the boundary element methods to describe elastic coupling between the different asperities. So the idea is like there's uh, some asperity pressing in here is going to affect deformation you know, on the neighboring sides because of the elastic coupling. So now this model gives us, uh, for a given um, normal load, it gives us distributions of contact areas and distributions of pressures as shown here. So this is pressure distribution. You can see, of course, it's expected that the real contact area is much smaller than the nominal contact area. And then, so we know the pressure in these points, then we can take these and we can translate them into our kinetic Monte Carlo model where we can consider chemical reactions um, uh, of, of the interface. And so what it means is that we can truly combine the quantum mechanical accuracy of the chemical reactions uh, that take place in the interface with a macroscopic model of the formation of rough surfaces to describe, in this case, how aging of contacts, um, uh, aging of contacts on experimentally relevant time scales and length scales. So that allows us to answer such questions as which contact would, will age faster, uh, the rough or the smooth one. And so this is uh, friction coefficient for the friction force. Uh, either way, friction coefficient is a function of hold time. So we're basically holding the tip. The, uh, we consider different roughness parameters for the surface. Uh, this is the one that was, has a, a larger, largest effect. Uh, the surface, the blue one, is the roughest. The red one is the smoothest. And so if you put the contact together, uh, the question is which one is going to age faster? And the answer is it depends on how long you are willing to wait, right? So if you just put them together at first, it turns out that the rough contact, the blue one, is going to age really fast. The reason is because the contact area is not large, but has very high pressure. And this pressure is just going to catalyze chemical reactions really fast. But if you wait longer, over a longer period of time, these high pressure points are used up. And then what matters over a long time is how much contact area we have. And that's why you see in the long term, the smoother surface with a higher contact area is going to have um, more chemical aging. Okay, so this is the. Um, the, the chemical um, aging part of my talk, where I want to, to show you how we develop multi scale model to address phenomena, where we have coupling of uh, uh, chemical reactions with quantum mechanical accuracy to deformation of, uh, of rough contact. So now the second part, I'd like to transition to my second part, where I'll talk about plastic deformation and the microstructural evolution of contacts. So I mentioned that if we're in a regime where the plastic deformation can take place, uh, then the microstructure uh, of the underlying material can change significantly in this tribal layer. So for example, it is recognized that metals that develop this um, nanocrystalline layer uh, are generally more wear resistant uh, than those that don't develop such a nanocrystalline tribal layer. And this is because nanocrystalline materials are stronger and harder. 
However, there's a limited understanding of how this microstructural evolution takes place, which materials will show it, and uh, how to control this microstructural evolution. So we were interested in that. And there are multiple mechanisms that can drive mi microstructural evolution during the formation of metals. And so some of the most common mechanisms are for metals are shown here. So we have grain boundary migration, grain rotation, grain coalescence. They typically drive, drive the grain growth. Some of the mechanisms uh, that have been shown to lead to grain refinement are dynamic recrystallization as well as uh, another example is deformation induced twinning. And so this is um, one type of uh, dynamic recrystallization shown here where these locations are introduced into the grains. They can arrange themselves into cells and sub boundaries and eventually develop new grain boundaries to refine the grain size, which improves the wear resistance. Now, the deformation just twinning applies only to certain materials that are able to twin. These are typically materials uh, for material scientists in the room that have low stacking fault energy. So copper is an example of that. Aluminum is the opposite. <laughs> so, um, so materials that can twin, uh, what can happen is that the twins can divide uh, the large grains into smaller regions. And these region eventually, these, these twins can sort of develop into grain boundaries and, and refine the, um, the sample of the smaller grains. So sort of example report, examples reported of that. Well, we were interested in aluminum because it has many excellent properties, uh, high strength to volume, uh, to weight ratio, um, very good corrosion resistance is developed this alumina layer on the surface that's protective against oxidation. But the um, wear, it's known that the um, wear resistance of aluminum is poor. And so here's an example showing um, wear rate of aluminum, this is dark, gray compared to brass and steel. So you can see they're significantly worse. Now, one of the ways to improve the wear resistance of metals that I alluded to earlier is to synthesize materials that have these nanocrystalline grains. And so here's an example showing um, nanocrystalline aluminum where decreasing the grain, this is uh, volume loss, decreasing the grain size led to improve uh, wear resistance. So this is great. However, the issue is that after prolonged sliding, of uh, materials such as nanocrystalline like aluminum, uh, many studies have reported that there is a grain growth taking place, and that grain growth eventually is going to decrease the wear resistance. So here's an example of ultra fine grain aluminum. So the grain size is smaller than the micron. You can see grain boundaries, and then after prolonged sliding, you can see this kind of developments of large grains with these locations inside. So once we go, it turns out that once we go to the micron regime or lower in this uh, ultra fine grain regime. It is difficult to introduce dislocations into a material like an aluminum because of its stacking, high stacking fall energies fast enough to sort of continue this grain refinement. So we asked the question, is it possible, since aluminum is so promising, is it possible to uh, suppress grain growth and control the microstructure evolution during wear of aluminum? So we did it uh, both from experiments and from simulations, and we considered three strategies here. I think I'll be able to get to two of them, and I'll just point to a paper on the third one um, because I'm looking at the clock. And so one of them is to look at the effects of sliding conditions. Another is to look at the effects of alloying elements and then effects of growth twins. So in aluminum, although the twins cannot be introduced during deformation, it turns out that it's possible to synthesize aluminum with twins to begin with. And then it's interesting to ask what the effect is, and we, we looked at that. OK, so let's start with the effects of sliding conditions. So I wouldn't be um, sharing this story if, uh, if we have not been successful in this regard. Um, so I'm happy to report that we have observed uh, word induced grain refinement and ultra fine grain aluminum for the first time. And we have identified conditions of when that occurs and what and we identified the underlying mechanisms. So here we have prepared two kinds of samples. One of them is ARB, so accumulative roll bonding. The other is PVD. Uh, so they, have they had comparable grain size to begin with. And it turns out that they actually had very similar uh, trends with respect to wear. And so this is basically the punchline of the story. Here's a TEM image of the sample uh, before and uh, the sample after. And you can see that near the uh, surface, there was a tribal layer with these nanocrystalline grains. So um, that's quite exciting. And so we also used the uh, um, transmission electron backscatter diffraction, TEBSD, to study grain size distribution. So this uh, shows. 
uh, the distribution of gray sizes, the blue one is before wear test and red one is afterwards. So you can see it shift to the left. So we see the green refinement. Okay. So now uh, we have also observed a transition from grain growth to grain refinement as a function of slamming conditions. And I want to tell you about this. So I'm showing you experimental results for the ARB sample and for the PVD sample. They're consistent with each other. We performed, in this case, single sliding, uh, either with a nano indenter, with a diamond tip, or with a tribometer. And here I'm showing how the stress increases in our experiments. The arrows mean that there's a grain growth, no trend of grain refinement. And you can see that as the stress increases, there's a transition from grain growth to no trend to grain refinement. Now, so theoretically, one would expect that at some very high level of stresses, there would be grain refinement. But the practical question is how high this stress is and is it achievable for materials of interest like aluminum in this case, uh, in particular because it's a high stacking fold uh, energy, stacking fold energy material. And the answer is yes, we're able to find it. Now it turns out that when we perform another experiment where we had multiple sliding, this is using the tribometer, uh, there was a thousand cycles. The stresses in this case were lower, so it's about one gigapascal. So we would expect from the previous experiments that it would be a grain growth in this case. However, we still saw a grain refinement. So what that means is that even at lower stresses, it is possible to induce grain refinement during wear of this nanocrystal ultra, ultra fine grain aluminum if the formation occurs at high enough rate and defects are introduced uh, fast enough. So what do I mean by that? Let me just show you the mechanisms that we found. The mechanisms of grain refinement and that we found in uh, ultra-fine grain aluminum is um, dynamic recrystallization. So there are two kinds of um, recrystallization mechanisms. There's a continuous and discontinuous one, uh, and we found both. So here's how it works. Even if the grains are initially dislocation-free, dislocations are obviously introduced during the mechanical deformation. And they can organize themselves into cell structures and eventually from grain boundaries, right? This is called continuous dynamic recrystallization. Now, further deformation um, leads to um, dislocation accumulation near the grain boundaries. Now, uh, the region with high dislocation density uh, have high energy and can become sites for nucleations of new grains that are defect free. So it's basically a new crystal that nucleates there. Now, these grains grow. Initially, they are defect-free, and eventually, further deformation um, is going to introduce new dislocations inside of the grain. So this process is called uh, discontinuous dynamic recrystallization, and the grains here have a characteristic appearance of being sort of fairly defect-free near the grain boundaries and having higher dislocation densities inside. I'm just going to show an example of that from our experiments. Here is, uh, I added red lines to guide the eye for the grain boundary. Here's the um, defect of dislocation free, relatively free of dislocation region, and you have this higher dislocation content inside of the grain. It's characteristic of this um, discontinuous dynamic uh, recrystallization. So what we have shown here that a way induced grain refinement in aluminum is, uh, can be achieved for contact stresses that are accessible under practical experimental conditions. And even for lower stresses, uh, grain refinement can be achieved during repetitive multiple sliding if we introduce the defects. Uh, fast enough. Okay, so the last um, one, uh, last um, part of the story I want to uh, I'll have time to tell you about is to look at the effects of alloying elements. Again, we were interested in how to control a microstructure during wear of uh, nanocrystalline or ultra fine grain aluminum. In this case, we consider we uh, look at our simulations. So these are molecular dynamic simulations, uh, and we have samples here of nanocrystalline aluminum, so it's smaller grain size. Uh, that are either pure nanocrystalline aluminum, or we also have uh, aluminum doped with zirconium. You can see these yellow points here, this is zirconium. The reason we chose zirconium because it segregates to grain boundaries in aluminum, and we wanted to understand the role of grain boundary dopants on wear. So our samples have the average grain size of 10 nanometers in this case, and there are two reasons to do that in our simulations. First is that, um, we wanted to study a large ensemble of grains in molecular dynamic simulations. So you can see here, when you have a tip, AFM tip, that we're sliding across the surface, and we measure friction force and wear volume, we want to be sliding over different grain orientation to get a good average response. And second reason is that this grain size of 10 nanometers, it's, it's very small for experiments, 
And so we really expect the grain growth in this regime. So this allows us to look at the effects of uh, really see clearly trends in the grain growth uh, from on the time scales of molecular dynamic simulations. So, so everything happens faster because the grain size is small. Okay, so what we did, we performed simulations, just started single asperity sliding. We did get tip, we simulate the tip, uh, and we slide in across the sample and we measure the friction force and the wear volume as a function of the normal load. Um, so we performed, this is just on a pristine sample. It was a clean sample, we just made it, uh, and then we slide in for the first time and once. And what we found is that the pure aluminum sample, which is the blue color, has a higher wear volume and higher friction than the dope sample, okay? And so the reason for that is, um, actually it's uh, consistent with the hardness of the samples that we measured. So we found that the dope sample is slightly harder than the pure sample in this case. Now, um, we have then performed another test, which I think is more interesting, is that we first scratch the sample multiple times, because again, remember, we were interested here in the evolution, uh, not just in the single sort of measurement. So we scratched the sample multiple times over the same location, as you may expect in the applications. So it was the pre-wearing. And after some pre-wearing, we performed, again, a test of a measured friction and wear volume as a function of normal load. And what we found that in this case, the trend was reverse. The pure sample had a better wear resistance. So the pure, pure sample is the blue one. So it's lower comparable to the dope sample and has a lower friction force. So the trend was reversed. So why is that? What happened? So it turns out that the reason for that is that um, as we expected in the pure nanocrystalline aluminum, we had a pronounced grain growth. But it turns out that in the dope samples, the grain size was uh, quite stable. Uh, we saw no grain, uh, grain growth on the time scales of our simulation. So the trends are shown here. This is basically histogram of the grain sizes in nanocrystalline aluminum. Blue is before sliding, red is after sliding. Uh, sorry, before pre-wearing and after pre-wearing, this multiple times. And where we really induce the microstructural evolution, you can see appearance of new large grains. And that does not happen when you have dopants present in the samples. So this is the main point that the zirconium dopants here suppressed the grain growth of nanocrystalline aluminum. Uh, this is sort of a side point by why nanocrystalline aluminum got better after the grain growth. This is um, very uh, sort of specific to the small grain size. It turns out that 10 nanometer grain size in the, is in a regime of so-called uh, inverse Holcott regime. And this regime is kind of unique in that their uh, grain growth here leads to strengthening of the material and eventually kind of turns over. But this is sort of a side point. The main sort of point of the story here is that the dopants can suppress and stabilize the grain size. So if you synthesize nanocrystalline or ultrafine grain aluminum, the grain size is going, uh, dopants are going to stabilize that. So what's the mechanism of that? So we have identified a number of mechanisms of grain growth in nanocrystalline aluminum. And uh, the details are published in the paper. But the most, uh, most of these mechanisms of grain growth are accommodated by dislocation emission from grain boundaries. Um, so we believe that this is an important clue for design of wear resistant nanocrystalline alloys. So specifically, you can see adding zirconium before sliding, uh, this is dislocation densities. They had comparable dislocation densities. After sliding, um, this, uh, the doped sample had half of the dislocation densities. And again, the dislocation emission is driving the mechanisms of grain growth that we found in our simulations. So um, the interesting question is whether it's always true that the dopants will do that. Is it always true that the dopants will suppress this location emission and suppress grain growth? And the answer is it's not. So we look at the um, literature in our earlier simulations and we found that uh, whether dopants increase or suppress dislocation emission and therefore the grain microstructure evolution depends on the dopants. So an example of our earlier study, when we look back on canonical line copper doped with silver, we found the silver uh, suppresses dislocation nucleation. Another group on the same materials but doped with zirconium show that it, uh, the dopants can make it easier to nucleate dislocations. So we believe uh, that it's actually, uh, it appears that the outcome where the dopants increase or suppress dislocation emission uh, is related to the fact whether dopants increase or decrease the free volume of the grain boundary. So there's some details there. But the bottom line that this finding provides a potential principle for design of these nanocrystalline metal alloys. 
So let me just show you uh, the last um, slide here, where we also asked, if you're looking at dopants, whether there's an optimum concentration of the grain boundary dopants that are going to make the material stronger. And uh, the answer is uh, that for nanocrystalline material, yes, the answer is yes. And so this is based on our molecular dynamic simulations, uh, in this case of copper, dope with silver. I alluded to those earlier. Uh, so you can see the strength of the nanocrystalline copper is a function of silver concentration, and the different colors, different grain sizes, has a maximum for a certain dopant concentration. So there's an optimum concentration that you want to have. Why is that? It turns out there's a change in deformation mechanisms for lower and higher concentration of dopants. So here below, I show a picture of the uh, phonesis um, strain. So the brighter color tells us where the deformation is localized. So for small uh, concentration of dopants, we can see that there's primarily grain boundary sliding. If you increase the concentration, then grain boundary sliding becomes more difficult and dislocation activity uh, takes over. So we develop a model, uh, analytical model that describes this transition. And in fact, the model for the case of copper um, uh, works very well. So the lines here uh, in this image are from our model and the points are from molecular dynamic simulations with two fitting parameters. And so, so that means that we can sort of use these dopants to optimize the microstructure, microstructure evolution, and uh, as well as um, the strength. So I don't have time to talk about the growth twins. I encourage you to read uh, our recent paper on this, but let me just jump to the conclusions. So um, I've shown that for the second part of my talk, the plastic deformation, that uh, we can have grain refinement and aluminum, which is exciting. It's a high stackable material. And that can be accomplished at reasonable stresses. So there's a transition from grain growth to grain refinement is a function of increased stress. And uh, I have just shown you that the dopants can be used to uh, control the microstructural evolution. And uh, a lot of ways by which they do that is by controlling dislocation activity and emission from grain boundaries. And whether the dopants will do that or not will depend on the specific dopant and uh, how much free volume it induces into the grain boundary. And uh, for twins, um, I'll just uh, stop right here. You can maybe have a look at the paper, but I'm happy to, at this point, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. All right, thank you, Isabel, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions? If you have any questions, just uh, write them in the chat. I guess I'll, I'll get things started. Um, you mentioned temperature in some places, but especially near the, the beginning, you were talking about it or talking about pressure. How does, is that, is the temperature kind of built into what you're showing or is it? Yeah, uh, so in all the models, all the models are, uh, have temperature built in naturally in it. So molecular dynamic simulations are um, velocities of atoms are coupled to temperature. So the higher the temperature, the higher the velocities. In the kinetic Monte Carlo models and the other models that we have, uh, the expression for the reaction rates uh, is an exponent uh, that has in the, um, uh, the denominator has a kT, so minus energy barrier over kT. So basically, the higher temperature, the more uh, the easier it is to form these reactions. So the temperature has kind of non-monotonic effects, but is included in every single aspect of the model. Okay, so I, according to the the equations, I guess they're just uh, proportional or inversely proportional the stress and the Temperature, I think that's what they were in the equations. Yeah, so the energy, uh, so in the exponent, there's a, uh, the, and the numerator has energy, which this is where the stress goes in. So the energy barrier is modified by stress. So okay. it's just kind of like static energy landscape. There's no temperature there. Okay. Although the temperature could affect that too. There could be some sort of other effects that are beyond the standard description. And then, so now our energy barrier is modified in this iron type of model. And then the exponent is kind of like Arrhenius relationship has temperature in the denominator. All right. Um, one thing, yeah, the, you're talking about the static friction, and you know, I think that definitely. The, actually, there's a question here, but I'll, I'll go with mine first. The, uh, um, I think your whole talk, you know, emphasizing that the surfaces change and it's it's not static. I think that's great. And then you talk about static friction and um, the aging. So it was, those are based on AFM? 
Yeah, so uh, people have seen them. Yeah, people have seen them in AFM. Actually, initially people have seen them in sort of rocks. Yeah, um, yeah. Experiments, right? So there's sort of Dietrich, and there's a lot of people looking at that, and they've seen that. Um, so traditionally, for decades, they thought about it as the changing in the contact area due to plasticity. Yeah, and I. That's what that was my question: the creep. And right. uh, how does that? Because I still think there's some of that going on. But I know what was going on. You know, how is that going on? If there is any of that in the uh, the single contact, yeah. So it, or is it just all the bonding? Yeah. yeah, it's a very good question. So it's sort of like the the project that we have is uh, so traditional people thought about just plastic cream, and aging actually is observed in like glassy materials as well during the formation. There's actually a very general a general phenomenon in many different systems, but but yeah, plastic formation can take place, and uh, but I think what was sort of uh, the contribution here. Um, that some people suggested that chemistry could also lead to aging. And people said, no, that's not gonna work. So Rob did these, these very nice experiments when he excluded the plastic deformation and he saw the aging was still taking place. So our contribution was to basically explain that. Now we are looking at plasticity as well because in the real context, you may have both. You're going to have chemical reactions as well as plasticity. And uh, you know, we're trying to see how much uh, one will contribute versus the other. And both, for instance, can depend on humidity. Humidity affects chemical reactions, but also you will talk about um, something like hydrolytic weakening that affects this location. So, so both can be important. They're just difficult to study. So we sort of breaking one piece at a time. All right, great. Uh, let's see, we do have some questions now. Uh, what is the role of adhesion or surface forces at the interface? So this, um, so I will answer this question sort of, you know, a couple of ways. One of them is that uh, in many cases, the adhesion is included. So if you form the first part, if you form chemical reactions, that affects adhesion. When I talk about static force, this is shear. You could pull it up, pull it you know, apart. In normal direction, adhesion will be there. Uh, for our simulations like molecular dynamics, uh, we um, sort of treat the adhesion a little bit um, uh, sort of hand wavy uh, when I talk about the dopants. So the adhesion is there, but it's not the true adhesion because uh, aluminum would have alumina on the surface. So now in molecular dynamic simulations, we have not considered that because we basically said we are uh, in experiments, we are, we are deep enough and we confirm in the experiment that the oxide layer is very thin, that we really exploring the bulk deformation of the material. And so, um, so we sort of can in, uh, exclude or sort of ignore some of, the, some of the effects. But if we included this in our simulations, that would increase the contact area, we would have some of the adhesive wear added to what we're seeing. So, um, you know, again, what do we do in simulations? We kind of try to um, break them apart into different contributions. So here we're looking at this sort of plowing contribution. All right, thanks. Uh, here's another question. Uh, how do you account for lubricant formulation? How do I, kind of, I don't see this question in the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm not sure how this is going to fit into the talk, but it says, how do you account for lubricant formulation? So uh, what is I the guess if you're putting a lubricant in your model, that's I'm kind of reading into the question, but. Yeah, so we can put lubricant, we again, so so depending what question we are asking, the reactive, the, the classical market dynamic simulation that we have with the reactive, reactive force field, we can put a lubricant between surfaces and the chemical reaction will take place. We have not studied the effect of lubricant here. So again, our sort of these kinds of simulations where we're trying to understand fundamental phenomena that contribute, we either looking at surfaces and experiments they don't have lubricant, or we're looking at plastic deformation, or we would specifically focus on experiments with lubricants and study those. It's very hard to have a model of everything in a single simulation. But lubricants are obviously important. Yeah. All right, so here's another question. Uh, it seems that as grains get smaller and smaller, the limit would be what we call a glassy material. Is there a well-defined difference between really small grains and a glass? Yes, there's a good question, right? So eventually you go into this limit, right? So, uh, but there is, because we um, sort of, from a material science perspective, we think of a crystal structure. So amorphous materials, they have short range order, which means they have like the same year's neighbors maybe medium range order, like the second year's neighbor atoms are the same, but there's no long range order. So in simulations, uh, and the same in experiments actually, uh, we can look at sort of ordering of atoms. And if there's a presence of long range order, which we can, because we know everything about every atom in the system, so we can determine that it's a crystalline structure. So we can clearly distinguish crystalline from amorphous regions. 
This can be also done uh, experimentally in uh, fluctuation electron microscopy, where you can see sort of the signature of amorphous versus crystalline regions. But if they are small enough, and there's a lot of strain in the grains, we know that the limit yet, but you go to five or three, then the grain boundaries are very thick, there's a lot of strain in the grains, and then I think you begin to be dominated by the amorphous grain boundaries. Yeah, so, uh, so he's, this is Ty Housel, by the way, he's asking a question. Says, uh, how many atoms is long range versus short range? It's a very good question. So people define it differently. So uh, various ways. Uh, typically, we think of the uh, medium range order as um, uh, sort of uh, the second nearest neighbor that from kind of cages or polyhedra. Uh, and the polyhedra then are uh, either packed in a sort of uh, uniform way, like in a crystal, or they are not. So amorphous and glassy materials will have well-defined polyhedron. There's an atom has a well-defined kind of cage around them, but then you cannot take these cages that we call polyhedra and pack them effectively into a crystal. So, so again, this sort of like some, a little bit of a fuzzy definition, but approximately the second year's neighbors would consider this a medium range order uh, that exists maybe in amorphous and in crystalline. Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any more questions at this point, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this. It was a very interesting talk. Um, actually, there's one more question from a professor, Minaj. It says, excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to refer to slide 20 or 21, where you showed the coast friction of up to five. And real-time friction applications, is it possible to have such a very high friction? 25. 20 to 21, sorry. But he was talking about the friction up to the coefficient of five. Right, so the friction coefficient that we get, actually they are not, um, so this is for geological materials, they're actually higher than what you would expect normally. Uh, and so they are, they are higher than, uh, than what we normally used to, but not as high as in what we see now as simulations. And one of the reasons, the reasons are not exactly understood. We know the only people who have so simulated this way have the sort of discrepancy of like, why is that? And I think that um, uh, the, what we think is happening is that when you take really engineering materials, like the geological materials, so we have a factor of two, I think, difference between our simulations and experiments in the friction coefficient. We think the reason for that is that the roughness of the geological materials that we're comparing to is not very well characterized. So when we're looking at surface chemistry of surface roughness, we're making lots of assumptions about what it is. We would love for people to be able to characterize the surfaces very well and tell us exactly what it is. We think we'll fix some aspects of the model, but there is certainty uncertainty in that. And the coefficient of friction here, again, it's higher than you would see, see typically for, you know, typically engineering materials, but not as high as in our simulations. Okay, so I think we'll stop there. But uh, any other anything else you want to say before we close it out? No, thank you very much for for coming for inviting me. I appreciate yeah, thank that. you for doing this. I think uh, it was very uh, interesting, and uh, I think everybody probably learned something.